All right. So hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Rand Toppy. I'm the uh, collections manager at the Hoboken Historical Museum. And uh, we are, um, we've got a, a small crew here. We've got um, half a baseball team from representing the, the, uh, this, the traffic signal mafia. <laughs> That's what it says on the shirt, right? <laughs> but, uh, Watch and, out. <laughs> yeah. And we've got um, some people in the audience, so we're kind of doing a hybrid event. Hello, everybody. Um, and, um, since we are streaming live, um, you are welcome to ask questions. I'll be behind the camera in a minute, and I'll, I'll be raising my hand and, and, and passing questions along. But um, right now, we've got Chris, right? And Chris is going to going to fire up a presentation, and um, and off we go. All right. Well, thank, I want to thank um, the folks uh, from the Hoboken Historical Museum for inviting us to come up here today. And I also want to acknowledge and thank uh, my three fellow Signal Mafia members, um, Mike Natale, <laughs> Randy Trezak, and um, Francis Curry all of whom are, are very dear friends of mine. And we are here to talk about a very unique, somewhat obscure hobby that we all share, which is a love and a fascination with and an interest in historic traffic signals. And that is actually how we ended up uh, getting this project underway. So we're here to talk about one traffic light in particular, which was hanging for 82 years at the corner of First and Washington Street in Hoboken. Um, I first saw the signal back when I was visiting one of our audience members, Josh Axerod, who I went to Franklin Marshall College with. Um, back in 2001, it was before 9-11, I'd come up to visit Josh in Hoboken, who's been a longtime Hoboken resident, loved the city, just an amazing, wonderful city. And you know, we're here as part of a wonderful exhibit on the history of Washington Street. So if anyone out there has never been to this museum, please come and see it. It's really, it's a terrific place. I'm a museum person too. I'm actually the executive vice president of the Baltimore Streetcar Museum. I'm from Maryland. I, I drove all the way up from Maryland just to talk about an old traffic light to show you how crazy I am about this stuff. But it, it's going to be a fun talk. And we put a PowerPoint together. Several of us are going to be passing along some cool information. But I saw that old traffic signal at first in Washington, and I think Josh was laughing at me because I just stared at it for like 10 minutes. I was standing in the intersection looking up at it like, that thing is ancient. How is that thing still hanging there? This was in 2001. So anyway, and just by way of introduction, I'm gonna just kind of go through the slides here. Um, we are traffic signal historians. And, and we look at it in a bigger context. Most of us also love history. We love the history of cities. We love bridges. We love old signage, neon lights, uh, roads, uh, drawbridges. You name it, we like it. But for, for us, our passion is traffic signals. And most of us actually have um, our own collection of stoplights that we keep in our garages, our, you know, our basements, et cetera. And you know, a lot of people have asked me, well, where did this fascination with signals come from? Well, I I'm actually going to share with you just a short clip. I, I grew up in the 70s with Sesame Street. And I can literally relate back the moment that I started to love these wonderful, unassuming objects that are literally hidden in plain sight that you hope people actually pay attention to, although not always. So I'm going to show you a little clip. This is from 1971 from the, the great children's television, television show, Sesame Street. You know what that is? Sure, that's a traffic light. It tells the cars when to stop and go. And it tells people when it's okay to cross the street. The light on the top is red. That means stop. When the light is red, everybody has to stop. By the way, there's a lot of neat, old, historic lights that show up in this. <laughs> At one time, New York just had red and green. Stop. The light in the top means stop. That's the red light. How about the light on the bottom? The light on the bottom means go. That's the green light. No 
would happen if we didn't have traffic lights? What? This. signal that is a, is a relic of Hoboken, New Jersey, and it is a survivor, and somehow it evaded being taken down or modified or upgraded by the city of Hoboken for 82 years, and I'm going to turn the presentation over to my good friend Francis, who has a terrific website, uh, GardenStateSignals.net, right. um, where he goes into a history of pretty much the entire traffic signal world of New Jersey where he is from. I'm from Maryland, but I have a very special fondness for New Jersey. My wife grew up in West Orange. Hi, Katie. I know she's watching. Um, she just commented, by the oh, way. Oh, that's great. That's yeah. great. She said, my <laughs> husband is the biggest nerd. Um, yep. so, <laughs> <We're going to laughs> uh, that's right. Um, so I'm going to invite Francis to come up. Uh, Francis and I have been friends since 2003. We have gone signal hunting through the wilds of northern New Jersey for years. And Francis you is, got killed, they, they, well, one time, but they, they didn't catch us. Um, I got the picture. Yeah. So Francis is going to tell us about the Horny Signal Manufacturing Company, which actually made the signal that's here at the museum. So Francis, take it away. Oh, and another amazing thing is it never got knocked down in all those years. But, uh, uh, yeah, and liking old traffic lights is something, you, I guess, like anything you don't decide to do. but. Uh, in my case, I think it, that decision was made for me and my brain was forming. And uh, I remember seeing this light for the first time with one of my other loves, which is old guitars. I, there used to be outlaw guitars on First Street, and uh, there was Hoboken Vintage. Mm -hmm. I was there one day, and I could see the light from a block and a half away, and I said, that, I'm going to go look at some guitars now, but that duly noted. I'm going to come back to that someday. So this was the light, and uh, yeah, it turns out it's made by Horny Signal Manufacturing, founded in 1924, um, and they went till 1947. More on that later. Why only 1947? Was that a band name? Yes, H O R N I is. I don't know uh, some Eastern European just, uh, well, lineage. I probably guess. Probably a modification of Eastern yeah, European. Yeah, yeah. Paul and Joseph Horny. Um, so. One reason I'm talking on this section is because I found some information from my website that you're looking at now on the slide. So some of these old lights, uh, this one here has six inch lenses, which is smaller than the, the light uh, we have in the museum. A little older, this is from the mid 20s, the Type 250. Um, another one, a more ornamental option a city could have for certain corners were these uh, Type 950s with the, they're not quite circular lenses. And on the, the two pictures on the right are stolen from an eBay auction I found. I, I didn't bid on the light. I don't remember what it went for, but one of those survived. And uh, another type is the 491, which they might all look the same to you, but uh, these are another old-time, mid-20s style, typically in the middle of an intersection at an island, uh, so-called, where they'd be installed on a pedestal. And here's actually one of those in Hoboken. So this picture is taken at 14th in Washington. Uh, that would have been erected in the 20s. I don't know when the photo dates from, probably about that time. So yeah, uh, Horny Signal was making and distributing traffic lights in this area where there were a lot of cars early on already. And uh, just running through this, here's a bunch of um, catalog material from late 20s, early 30s. We're getting closer now to the signal from our museum. And uh, these signals are much closer to it. They're more standardized. They're eight inch lenses. They're getting closer to what we're used to in the world as uh, knowing as traffic lights and they're aluminum cast. On the right here are some ads. They were, Horny was uh, distributing signals in Europe. Those are ads from Spain. Uh, here is 
you'll see the word Ruleta because uh, that's a kind of a related company that uh, produced traffic signals and they took some of the old horny modals and created lights under their name. But basically, if you look at these, these are horny style lights under the name Ruleta. On the left being a light that I have in my basement, on the right being one of those classic guys in New York City. Any of you my age or older may remember seeing these two color red and green lights in New York City a lot. If that caught your notice like it did to me. Uh, and some more ads here from the late 20s, uh, both Ruleta and Marbleite and Horny Signal. These, uh, this is one of those mysteries that uh, we who are interested in this stuff and collect these things have been trying to decipher for years <coughs> looking through old ads like who owned these, when, and you know, what brand are they, etc. So Horny, Marbleite, and uh, Ruleta are names that we throw around a lot as collectors. Okay, so here's the light that that is uh, the star of the show today. This is a, a sectional, the sectional horny from first in um, Washington, and like Chris said, it was there for 81, 82 years before it came down. I can't believe it was never even knocked down. So, um, and this picture in the middle was taken by Kevin Mueller, who's a good friend of Chris's in Merrill, right? And, uh, looking up. So you can get that view right now if you all come down to the museum. You just don't have the blue sky and the uh, mast arm above it anymore. But it's a lovely scallop body shape to it. Uh, it's an eye-catching light. It's a very old, pretty looking thing. It's cool. <laughs> well, we're here. Um, and you can't find them anywhere. And just to round out a little bit more of the horny then uh, in the late 40s, actually late 30s, they started making what really look more like traffic lights we're used to. Uh, they changed the design a bit more there. I call it closed sectional signals. It's just uh, they were easier to put together and uh, what's the word I want to use? Like Legos, you, know, you just want to pull them apart and uh, configure them any way you want. It's a lot easier to do that. And uh, let me finish my bit here with um, here's a publication now, Horny Signal. They made a lot of stuff for the World War II, in that era, they did a lot of things for the Army. They produced communication equipment, and I'm not quite sure of all the products they made, but they had big contracts with I guess, the Army, tools, um, all sorts of stuff. So uh, some very nice patriotic language here in a publication that Horney put out in 1943 where Paul Horney says, we must ask ourselves if we as soldiers on the, product, on the production front are giving the, quote, last full measure of devotion, unquote. It's, Clear that for us, the line of duty is to reach out beyond ourselves in the performance of whatever task is assigned to us. As production soldiers, our duty is to make more, to give more, to toil more. I'll stop there, but uh, it's interesting to see where um, this language came from and where things went from there. But uh, I'll turn it back over to Chris. All right. Thanks. Well, as, as, as bad luck would have it for the Horny Brothers, um, for all their patriotism, they did make a lot of money. Uh, they actually made over $17 uh, million in war work during the 1940s, but they never paid a dividend. And it turns out in 1947, they all got indicted. Um, and, and I do have to say that the, the quality of newspaper reporting in the 1940s is unlike anything that we have today. I mean, they, they deep dove into every little detail about the Horny Brothers literally milking this traffic signal company for every penny. And, and one of my favorite quotes is Joseph Horny, who was the plant foreman at the Newark, New Jersey plant. This sounds like something out of like a, a 1920s gangster movie, like, you know, Charles Horny, the nebulous figure at the Newark plant in New Jersey was arrested and they posted, they had $7,500 cash bail. So they were not only accused of theft, but apparently Paul Horney had a little bit of a gambling problem. So a, a receiver had been appointed for the company and they start investigating their finances. Well, it turns out that Paul had written a company check for $6,100 to pay off a gentleman in a poker game where he lost the, the hand and had to pay up and he wrote a personal check to this mining wealthy magnet from Montana and the guy said your check's not good enough for me I want a different check so Paul Horney grabs the company checkbook 
and writes him a check for $6,100 to pay off his gambling debt. This is straight from the company. So, so part of the profits from that traffic signal back there may well have helped to pay this poor guy's uh, gambling problem. And he wrote it off as engineering expenses. So I, just, I'm, I, I was actually reading that article just laughing hysterically. Now, the company was sold. And it was sold to a company called Marvelite. And if anyone traveled the streets of New York City from about 1957 until well into the 1990s, chances are virtually every other signal head at an intersection that you pass under was made by Marvelite. I actually have a Marvelite controller that runs about the 15 traffic lights that I have in my garage. Um, it, and, and so Horny probably made out. I don't know whatever happened to the Horny brothers. Uh, we know Paul was living at the Ambassador Hotel in Newark. He didn't even have a fixed address, so who knows? So I want to sort of shift over to the first in Washington signal because we, we really want to keep this, you know, Hoboken-centered as much as we can. So let's talk about what the world was like in 1936. I really want to put a context to the installation of, of this, this really magnificent old signal. So, of course, it's hanging above the Sinatra Lounge, and I just I love sitting there listening to old blue eyes watching the light change. And it's just, for me, it, it, it brings me great joy. But, but Frank Sinatra had just started singing with one of his first musical groups, the Hoboken Four, was performing at the Casimir on Elks. He also had a car, which was very unusual back then. So I, I like to picture Frank Sinatra driving down Washington Street with his cigarette hanging out of his mouth and his, his characteristic rough demeanor coming to that red light, probably cursing because he had to wait 30 seconds for the light to change green. Uh, that light would have been there as Frank Sinatra was starting his career. And I want you to think about, too, in northern New Jersey, the context of this light, now it was the Great Depression, but the explosion of infrastructure that was automobile-based was just unlike anywhere in the country. I mean, the Pulaski Skyway, which I passed under on my way here, which I still think is one of the most magnificent pieces of road infrastructure in, in the whole country, had just opened four years before that light was installed. Uh, the George Washington Bridge had just opened to traffic five years before in 1931. The Lincoln Tunnel hadn't even opened yet. It was just about done. And of course, the nearby Holland Tunnel just south of us was about nine years old, opening up in 1927. You know, we were still having 16% uh, unemployment. Uh, Jesse Owens, um, a, a very famous Olympian and African American, went over to Hitler's Germany. Uh, and humiliated the Germans in the 1936 Olympics. He won four gold medals. And General Motors had cornered nearly 50% of the automobile market in 1936. They sold 43% of all the new cars in the United States. And I like to focus on northern New Jersey because this was, even in those days, even, even notwithstanding the Depression, was a booming, growing, thriving megapolis of towns that stretched you know, from, from as far south as, as New Brunswick and, and as, as, frankly, as far north as almost the, the New York state line. People needed to get around. They needed, they were driving cars. Even public transit in the 1930s, the streetcar system run by public service, and I'm very fond of streetcars, um, was starting to go the way of buses, trackless trolleys, and automobiles. So, you know, here's some cool old pictures. I love this picture of the Holland Tunnel. Uh, in the 1950s. And actually, that traffic light up there is a Krauss Heinz. I have one of those in my collection. Uh, it's a beautiful light. Here's the Lincoln Tunnel opening in 1937. I mean, these, these were massive public infrastructure investment projects. Um, the George Washington Bridge, another just you know phenomenal feat of engineering, truly one of the great wonders of the world. And, and I love this picture. This is, this is Route 1. Now, remember, before the interstate highway system, if you wanted to travel, from, let's say, Hoboken to Baltimore, where I live, you would have gone on Route 1. And this is what it looks like in the 1930s. And by the way, that traffic light hanging out there is a horny for a cluster that is very similar to the one in every sand. That's actually one of the reasons I love this picture. But you know, the, the, the traffic control technology was in its infancy at this time. There, there were no turn signals. There was, you know, there was no don't walk signals. It was just clusters of red, yellow, green stoplights in many ways hanging over the middle of the intersection. These people were lucky. There was actually two of them. They were only eight inches. And of course, in more recent years, federal standards changed all of that. So let's talk about the, the Hoboken Horny um, through the years. And thank goodness we have an amazing photographic history of the journey of this light. And I do say journey because 
you know, if you're an old car collector and you find an old car in a barn, you refer to it as a survivor. It's an all original survivor. And, and this traffic light, when we saw it, the first thing I noticed is that it had not been converted to LED. Many traffic signals, a lot of older ones, had been upgraded as early as the late 1990s with LED technology, but they would keep the original aluminum metal housings. This one still had its original incandescent bulbs. And so I thought that was kind of cool. The other thing about this light is it was the only one at that intersection. Nowadays, you come up to an intersection, there's four of them up here, there's one over here, they got one hanging back here. I mean, you, you'll definitely see it, but when you approached this intersection, that was all you saw. And Washington Street's a pretty wide street, so you really had to look for this light. It was not easy to see, and if you go stand under the light, you can see that they adjusted it and angled it for certain directions so that you could see it. And now, what's interesting is even back in 1936, um, First Street was a one-way street heading east. That's right. So there was a trap. There was a, a signal head facing backwards. That was for the pedestrians. But you almost had to walk in the middle of the intersection just to look up and see is the light red or green. So you, you kind of, I'm Catholic, and you say Hail Mary and just go and hope that when it changes <laughs> to yellow to red, you got enough time to get across. Um, so of course, here's a map of, of where uh, where the light was. And and I do love sort of the fact that. The streetscape really didn't change much at all in the 82 years that it was there. And, and of course, this, the picture on the right, which was taken by Kevin Muller, um, who uh, I will say on a special note, officiated my wedding. Um, he is a man of the cloth and a traffic signal fanatic. Uh, hi, Kevin, I hope you're watching. Um, and he has a collection that is just phenomenal. But if you can see that the, the, the streetscape really didn't change that much. So this, and, and what else is absolutely incredible about this light is it's hanging on the same hardware from 1936. It's, it's what's called a double guide wire signal. And you can see there's two, there's two strong, sturdy, they're, they're more like steel uh, rods that are connected to the end of the pole that basically keep the light supported and they keep it from bending in the wind. This thing has been through hurricanes, it's been through blizzards, it's been through blistering hot summers, cold winters, and being a transit fanatic, I couldn't help but also point out that Washington Street at the time had a, an electric trackless trolley bus line running down it, and the pictures are a little washed out, you know, the quality of the pictures from the old days, but you can see the, the hardware for the, the double wires um, above the street, which I think is kind of cool. And they're actually, it's funny, I saw a bunch of pictures here. If I had seen them, I would have dumped them into this presentation. We would be here for two hours. <laughs> but, but we did show some of the history of the light over the years. And it shows up in a lot of pictures. Fast forward to 1988, it's still there. Actually, at one time, it was painted silver. There was a lot of northern New Jersey traffic signals were painted silver. And you can see it. It, it, it went through a couple of different paint jobs. When I first really took an interest in the signal, I started coming up to see it starting, as I mentioned, in the year 2001. It was July of 01. I'd come up to ride the old Redbird subway cars in New York before they were retired. And then I went over to Newark to ride the city subway PCCs. My museum actually has one of the old Newark PCCs. We're restoring it right now. Cool. And then I came to see my friend Josh. And we went out to dinner. He was living on Washington Street at the time. And then we came to that intersection. I, I, I stood there. And, and I, I didn't know who made it. I didn't know as much about signals, really, until I met Francis a couple of years later. But then we started coming up and documenting the history of this light. And we would, we would come up and take pictures of it and keep an eye on it. And we were just in awe that it, it was still there. Again, that this is what it looked like from the approach. There wasn't a second cluster on the left-hand side. That was it. And actually, at every intersection on Washington Street, they all were hung like that. And I have to say, on a personal note, you know, my grandparents retired to Cape May, New Jersey. And I remember vividly as a kid going down to the boardwalk. And along the boardwalk, they had little clusters of stoplights at all the intersections that look just like this. So you know, every time I see a street that looks like that, it just, it just brings me back to like my childhood. You know, I grew up in the 70s, and there's still a lot of old signal technology that was out there. And here's another shot. You, know, look, you don't see too many pictures of it looking south from this angle. Uh, which is kind of neat. And you can see the other one down the street is a newer head, but same deal. It's just one single light hanging out, you know, maybe a couple of feet into the intersection. Um, and from certain angles, these were not easy to see. And then we got word that the city of Hoboken 
was going to do a massive street upgrade of Washington Street. And of course, my first thought was, oh no, this light's finally gonna get taken down and what's gonna happen to it? And, and I, I was in a panic I, I, because I knew one of two things was gonna happen to this light. It was gonna end up in a dumpster or it was gonna end up in some signal collector's basement never to be seen again. And I thought to myself, you know, this traffic light is a part of Hoboken's history. It is a part of the streetscape of Washington Street. It needs to stay here in this town. It needs to be preserved. And so I actually called the mayor's office um, out of the blue. I'm, I'm in Baltimore. I call the Hoboken mayor's office. I'm like, I want to speak to the mayor. And they're like, who the heck are you? And I'm like, I'm a traffic light nut. And, and I want to tell you all about this cool old signal of a first in Washington click. So, so I called him back, and finally I got somebody that didn't think I was literally crazy on the phone, and I said, just do me a favor. Go out to that intersection and take a look at that light and ask yourself, have you ever seen anything like that? Any other place you've been? And you know what? He, he went out, he looked at it, he called me and said, you know what? That thing is pretty unusual looking. And I said, it is, it is an 82-year-old, horny manufactured traffic light that needs to be preserved by this city. You cannot let anything happen to it. And so cue that up. He said, I'm going to get you in touch with a guy named Robert Foster, who happens to be the, uh, I guess, the head of the Hoboken Historical Museum. And Bob and I started communicating probably around 2016 or 17, I want to say. It took them a while to take the light down. They, they made plans to upgrade Washington Street well <laughs> over a year before we pulled the signal down. And um, so this is actually a picture of the day it came down. You can see it sitting on the ground over there. And you can see the new lights going up, and they're much bigger, they're newer, they have countdown pedestrian don't walk signals. The technology on them is great, but nothing like the old one. This is what it looks like today. Yes, you can, they're, they're much more visible. Personally, I think they're a little too big for the streetscape because now they're using what are called 12-inch lenses. They're all LED, um, but they have actuators, so when you pull up, the light will change. You don't have to wait for it to cycle through. But, but none of the charm and beauty uh, of, of the old light. So I wanted to talk next about just the process of how we got this thing into the museum. I mean, that light weighs, what would you say, about 250 pounds, would you say? Yeah, conservatively. Yeah. Maybe 300 pounds. So it, it is, it, it's, it's a beast. In fact, um, one of the things that is kind of amazing is for about five months between the day it was taken down and the day we hung it, which was in October of 2018, almost um, three years to the date, it sat in the municipal parking garage right across the street. Nobody bothered it, probably because it was too heavy to even pick up <laughs> by any human being. It just sat in an alcove up on like, what, like the fifth floor of the garage, I want to say. It was, it was way out of the way. It was the only place Bob had to store it because he couldn't just bring it here and stick it on the floor. He wouldn't have been able to walk. Um, <laughs> So we all came up on October 20th of 2018. Bob got a lift, and we had one day to rewire, put a new controller in, raise it up, hook it to the top. And actually, my friend Randy um, has, has experience. <laughs> he is, uh, he's worked for the telephone company for many years. He, he used to install telephone cables, so he knew how to mount it to the, to the top. And actually, this building we're in is a very old warehouse that has I-beams with large bolts that literally run through the support beams for the ceiling. So we were able to tie this in directly into the overhead beam. Um, and so Randy did that. I'm going to show you some cool pictures. So, you know, but we had one day to do this. All of us are from, well, I'm from out of state. Randy's from, New, from, uh, from Long Island. Mike, where, where are you, where are you living? You're up in New York as well. Francis is the only one who's kind of close. He's over in Somerset, which is still like a good 45 minutes from here. So we had one day to do all this stuff. So here's some kind of fun pictures of us of us uh, coming up to, to see the light. And, and of course, when we saw it, the thing is massive. When, when you see a traffic light up close compared to what it's like hanging up you know, outside on a the street, they look nothing like they do when you're driving a car obeying them when they're when they're out in, in the wild they're, they're massive um, you know pieces of infrastructure one of the first things that was truly incredible was the wire was all original 1936 era cloth wire most of which had been completely stripped coming out of the top nozzle and it, how this thing still even lit up without shorting itself out 
was we couldn't believe it so here's some so the first thing we had to do was take all of the original wiring that went from the top that led to the terminal strip inside out but the problem is we couldn't hand thread the wires through the pipe work so we had to tie off the new wire onto the old wire and pull it through that way we could actually get it to thread because we did not have the hardware to take all those 82 year old pipes off we never would have been able to do that so we had to really think this thing through to make sure we didn't pull all the wires out and not be able to get the new ones through so we did it um, and it took us several hours to do now we have a small digital controller that was made by a really cool guy up in Canada named Sean Green um, so that is what is what is making the light sequencers Francis uh, with his wires and the other thing that I thought was cool um, is the bulbs that we pulled out of the signal was just a, a mishmash I mean, there's one spotlight, one LED, there's a couple incandescents, one or two actually quite vintage that have sort of the, the, the fluted tops. And actually, the, the LED bulbs in the spotlight were terrible because they blocked out the light from behind the bulb, so the reflectors really didn't reflect much. So when you drive up to the light, it looks like just this moon in the middle of the lens, and then the rest of it's dark, kind of spooky, and also not, yeah. It, it. That, that, that spot was my favorite one. Oh, uh, yeah. That big spot bulb. Yeah. And I remember, I, now that I, I took pictures on it right before it came down, I remember exactly seeing the spotlight behind the right. lens. That, it's yeah. like a heat lamp. Yes, <laughs> exactly. You put French fries on it. It's probably the one that melted the red lens. The pigeons love it. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it was warm in the winter. And one of the funny things about the horny signal manufacturing company, aside from the name, go ahead and snicker. So we're going to say the word horny a lot. It's okay. It's, it's Paul and his nebulous brother at the Newark plant. Um, they, they stamped the name on everything. I mean, they stamped it on, on, the, on the, the frame, on the, on the hanger. And so this was sort of like our wonderful moment. We wired it up, and of course, we had to test each socket. So we basically just hooked everything up just to make sure it would light up uh, without throwing a breaker, and it did. So this was actually the first moment the signal had been under power of any kind for several months. And what's really cool about this light is, with one exception, it's got its original lenses, which have a very unique look to them. They're, they're kind of beaded, and they really throw the light out in a way that they, they're, they're very visible. Um, they, they, it's, it's almost like a lighthouse type lens. Like modern lenses are all LED backlit, so they're you know they're a little more simple and uniform. But this thing. They put a lot of effort into it. So now here's where Randy the Spelunker gets up on the lift to do his thing. So he prepped the wire, he prepped the cables before we lifted it. And then we had to, the light wouldn't actually fit on the lift. We were hoping to put it in the middle of the lift and it was too darn big. So what we did is we strapped it to the end set a Hail Mary, and Randy hits the up button. And we're waiting for the thing to either fall off, or Randy to fall off, or the lift to tip over. <laughs> and, and I think the best part was that it's 250 pound light, but I'm a 350 pound light. So, so, so I, I offset the tipping by being on the other end of the lift. So all those cheeseburgers that Randy had eaten yeah. served as well. That's your fault. You took us the cheeseburger. cheeseburger. <laughs> it was all part of the grand plan. I, I was sweating bullets as this thing was going up. But you know, I mean, Randy, Randy was a pro. I mean, he, and actually what he did is he, we hooked it up in stages. So he secured it to the cable when it was only a few feet off the ground. This was very smart. And then we would raise it a little bit more. You'd take up the slack, secure it again, cool. make sure it would hang. And, and I will tell you, from a safety standpoint, we actually hooked an auxiliary chain to the light once it was at the top, tied it into a different beam rod. So that thing is not going anywhere. And actually, that's the way they hung them in New Jersey. If you <laughs> drive up to it, when you leave here, the next time you stop at a red light, take a look at the connection hardware. You'll see a little chain. And that's actually a safety mechanism in case the clamp breaks. And actually, not a lot of states do that. But New Jersey does. So here's here's Randy up on the lift at, at the height of it, um, and of course we finally got the light up. We hooked it up to the controller. It started cycling through its its wonderful cycle, and uh, and then you know we cleaned it, we adjusted it, we wanted to angle it a certain way, and there it is. Um, you know it, it was. It was so much fun to do this project. It took us about 12 hours, I want to say. Yeah, it was a whole day. Francis and I had to run to the Home Depot down in Jersey City because we didn't have enough wire. I mean, we, we really 
we put a lot of work in. Mike Natale is an electrician, so you know he was really helpful in making sure that we safely could rewire the light. We re-insulated all the original wiring. We wanted to make sure it was, was safe. And of course, uh, Randy had the shirts made, which are the Signal Mafia shirts. So uh, you know we uh, you know we we hammed it up uh, you know for for the day. So so I thought what I'd do. Um, you know, we have about 20 minutes, and again, if anybody has questions, you can send it through. But, you know, corny signals and also just New Jersey lights in general, you know, really in the context of just what a neat state this is. How many varied places are like Ashbury Park? I mean, this is one of, if you might remember, Francis showed us a model of this um, in his presentation on the main, um, you know, what Bruce Springsteen referred to as the circuit. Um, you know, this is right in front of the uh, Paramount Theater, and you can see the Berkeley Terrace Hotel uh, back behind this image. That's what the traffic lights in Ashbury Park looked like in the 1930s. Um, Horney actually made one of the first poly plastic type signals during World War II when aluminum was in high demand. And there's one of them that, that actually one of our, our friends named David Prince found in Hackensack. It's still there. It's it's Bakelite. It's it's a plastic like substance, and it's. It's still out there, so wow. you know, and it's it's still going strong. You're probably but, looking after that one. Right? That you know, we still kind of keep it up. This <laughs> one disappeared, but Francis found this one a couple of years so back in '03, I would say, and it's been gone for a while. But that again, just to show you kind of what these look like, and they were all over New Jersey. We found this old photo from Bayonne, um, and you know, I mean, Jersey, every state had its own unique way of displaying, painting, and, and having their traffic signals shown to the driver. New Jersey's classic setup, and, and they have a lot of old postcards of towns from New Jersey, which I just love. I think this one is, uh, is this Somerset, Francis? Somerville. Somerville. So the, the, the New Jersey setup that I remember as a kid in Cape May was just like this. You have, you know, you know, a very unique mass arm, and these were are still very common in New Jersey to this day. This this poster is probably from the late 1960s, but in the old days, most of them were painted um, green or black. Yellow did not become as favored in the state probably until the 1980s. Uh, I remember even the late 70s, most of the lights were still green. Um, and you know, so they were a very whimsical way of hanging them. They, they typically would hang in clusters. They would try to try to l limit how much damage they do to the sidewalk. They, if you can have one pole controlling three signals at once, that's better than putting eight poles around, although today they'll just put the eight poles around like they did <laughs> on Washington Street. But this is kind of a neat, I mean, this is Newark, New Jersey in the 1960s. I think it's the corner of Springfield and Bloomfield Avenue in the Central Ward, uh, actually in the 50s, I mean, and these lights were probably brand new. And you can see, you know, they're double guide wire. They have sort of a small mass arm. And, you know, they, they weren't always the easiest things to see, but they were 8-inch heads. They weren't the 12-inch style of today. We found a couple of neat shots of Hoboken in the old uh, Fabian Theater. All right. um, and, uh, you know, you can see the picture on the right. Actually, Bob, I'm not sure exactly what street that is. Can you identify 14th that? Street. 14th Street. 14th Looking Street. Looking towards the river. That's a okay. right That's one the, block from here. It's right. right, right? Where you go over the... Yeah, that's at the foot of the dot yeah. viaduct, yeah. but we're okay. looking... Uh, east to New York City, and that's a crane from Bethlehem Steel uh, Shipyard, which is where we're sitting right now. Oh, God. Great. Which is cool. And this is Palisades Avenue. And, and, and this is, if you were driving on any, you know, Hudson County town street in the 70s, this is what you would see. These are all four directional clusters, mostly still from the 1950s. In fact, way off in the distance, you could see an ancient four-way that's painted yellow. But, you know, you can say, I mean, these are marble eight four ways, and I have one of these in my collection, and actually several of these guys probably do too. And I love the old transit bus, the old GM transit bus, which is signed for uh, 14th Street in Hoboken, which is, is kind of cool. Union City in the 1930s, and I'm like a big transit nut, so I, you know, I love streetcars. So any, any of the old streetcar pictures, you can always spot some of the, the antique traffic signals. I'm not even sure what brand that is. Do you guys have any idea what kind no, of that is in the background? So that's kind of like Union City, Bergen Line Avenue. That's and Newark. Oh, really? I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, actually, and it's funny. The, uh, in the corner is Newark. Yeah, in the, the corner, actually, in the lower corner. corner, and I think I have a blown up version of that one. Um, again, being a big Springsteen fan, I love Asbury Park. This traffic light is actually still there to this day. Wow. Uh, they painted it yellow, and it's right next to the old Palace um, Entertainment Complex, which, uh, uh, if you like the song Born to Run, when Springsteen sings Beyond the Palace, 
Hemi powered drones streamed down the boulevard. This was the palace that he was referring to uh, in Asbury Park. And actually, this is the New York City subway, a lot of old traffic lights. And I couldn't tell, and I'm going to defer to Francis and, and Randy. Um, are those GEs or are they? Horn they're hornings? Yeah. Okay, so actually, so this is South Orange Avenue, where the intersection of Route 280 crosses right behind this. It's not far from the Garden State Parkway interchange. This streetcar has to predate about 1954 because they upgraded the PCCs that same year. But there's always been a signalized crossing at this stop on the Newark City subway. And back in the early 1950s, that's what it looked like. Um, Washington, coming back to Washington Street, I mentioned that just about all the intersections had the single clusters. Again, very unassuming. And, and what was kind of neat is each, 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 each intersection that had one alternated. So, you know, the, the first one would be on the right, and then you can see the one down on the left, and then they kind of they kind of went back and forth as you went down the street. And I, I don't know if they did that intentionally or not, but it kind of had kind of a cool look. I mean, that was that was your traffic light. There was no don't walk lights. There was no actuators. There was no countdown pads. There was no turn signals. It was just a four cluster stoplight, and when that thing turned red. You had to wait for the old electromechanical controller to cycle through its little dial that usually took about 45 seconds, and then it would turn green and you'd get to go. Uh, that's another angle. I think that's Fifth and uh, in Washington. That's another light that we thought was cool. It was actually a very early uh, marble. Like Francis, you said about 1947? Yeah, very old. Yeah, so there was a lot of old stuff. Actually, Union City had these what are called AGA signals. There's still one left, and they're from, what would you say, about 19... 20s, 30s? Yeah, they're, they're pretty old. So the Hoboken Much label is pretty old, yes. but Union might have, have the older ones, but they LED'd them, and they put them on new poles. So ours is still more cool. So where do you think this one is? Um, that one's been taken down. That oh, okay. one was at the corner of Palisades. There is, there is still one AGA in service. We actually passed it on the way in. Oh, cool. A visit, visit, yeah. Visiting your old friend. Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, you know, if we go out to... Essex County near where my wife grew up, that's Bloomfield, and they had like 12 inch Econo lights. But we call these the trombone lights, where they were on these masts that were sideways. So a lot of the urban places of New Jersey had signals that were hung horizontally. And it was, I always thought it was a cool look. In fact, Atlantic City, when I was a kid, you could look down Atlantic Avenue and see 30 of these things, and then all of them would change together, like just from one end to the other. So it was just like, like a string of Christmas lights. Um, and of course, um, in uh, Montclair, they had the same type. This was a very common type of setup, especially in northern New Jersey, and mostly from the 1950s with Marble Light Heads, which was the successor company to, um, uh, to Orny. Uh, West New York, for us signal geeks, is still the, the destination. They've left a substantial amount of their ancient stuff. We're talking like ancient crazy stuff and what's funny is cars will drive through these red lights because yeah. they cannot see them we will stand on the intersections palisades mm -hmm. avenue is just a string of old stuff and they you know again we, we kind of watch this stuff a lot of it is still there old four directional lights i mean most places in america this stuff's been gone for 40 years mm -hmm. but you come up here to these towns that, that just clog <laughs> the hudson river there's so much neat stuff there. Irvington in the 60s, they still had their old street lights. They had the, the long mast arm lazy signals that were mostly marble light. I love this one in Jersey City with the old GM bus. They were painted yellow. Um, they had neon pedestrian don't walk signals. Um, and uh, actually Francis had found for his website some really incredible old pictures of the state highways of New Jersey. Now under federal standards, there is what's called What's it called? The Manual of Manual Uniform, Uniform uh, Traffic Control Devices. Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices has been the bane of signal collectors because when they upgrade the standards for traffic lights, the first thing you munis the municipalities do is take all the old stuff down. We love the old stuff. So when the old stuff comes down, we, we cry, we whine, and then we try to find it for our basement. <laughs> um, or, or Randy, who actually is in the business of buying and selling traffic lights, um, you know, can go out and actually sell them. But, what I love about this view, this is a state road from New Jersey. These are eight inch signals. So today the, the federal government would never allow federal dollars to be used to install a setup like this because they want the larger 12 inch heads that are LED. 
So, but this is what, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, when you were driving down Route 1 or Route 9, and you would come to one of those wonderful junk handle intersections that New Jersey is so famous for, um, this is what they looked like. And actually, again, for me, this is, the, this is the Jersey I remember when I was a kid going to Cape May. Like, I remember stopping for intersections that looked just like this. And, you know, again, they still had the double guide wire setups. They were sort of, sort of hanging them all over the place. I could never understand why they would hang a cluster over the opposite lane of traffic. Like, what's the point of that? But again, it's to give you good visual as you're coming up on the intersection. This is another great one. I mean, this one's turning yellow. Uh, these are old police photographs, by the way, taken from accident sites, so maybe they actually <laughs> weren't all that safe. <laughs> and, and of course, today, this is what you see. This is what they look like. And, and obviously, they're safer, they're more standardized, they're modernized, but do they have the soul <laughs> <laughs> of that first in Washington signal? Um, I don't think so. And actually, this is um, one of the AGAs in West New York. I think Father Kevin took this, um, took this one. Uh, I found a couple of these survivors on, on the, I think it's the JFK Boulevard that, that parallels the Garden State Parkway up in the East Orange, Newark area. As a kid, I used to love driving up to Garden State. I would have my nose pressed against the window looking for all these cool lights that had the crosses on them. Like, oh, I love the ones with the crosses with little wires. I'm, I was a weird kid. Um, and of course, Park Avenue. Francis and I took a trip over to East Orange in 2003 just to document and take pictures of the streetscape the old signals, most of the stuff is all gone now. It's all been upgraded. Um, because again, towns get federal dollars, you know, they, they, they like it. I actually, I was gonna introduce Randy. He has a, a Facebook distribution um, site for buying old traffic signals. If anyone actually would like to add a signal to your basement, your garage, um, Randy will stay. You can, you can private message us on Facebook. Uh, he's a great guy. I've gotten a lot of stuff from him. Um, Just as recently as today. Absolutely. <laughs> and and uh, Francis uh, has a great website called Garden State Signals. Even if you're not a signal nut like us, um, just seeing the history of these cities told through the, through the, through the view through a windshield of just an average traffic signal uh, is kind of cool. Um, and actually, Francis has one of the greatest collectible signals. This is an old New York City two-sectional roulette which is based on the horny mold, so it's a very closely associated light. And didn't you just get that Passaic River sign, Francis? Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. This is my collection. That's my garage. Um, I don't have the neon sign lit because I literally don't have enough power in my garage to light everything up all at once. Um, but uh, my wife puts up with an awful lot um, with, with my collections. and. Uh, so anyway, that, that is our, our presentation. Um, and Randy, uh, Mike, Francis, did you guys want to come up and add anything? Oh, you did a very good job. Great job. And, uh, Great job. I, I will quote, it for, for interesting sources, if this topic is of any interest to anybody aside from us, um, the traffic commissioner of New York City from 1962 to 1968 was a man named Henry Barnes. He invented something called the Barnes Dance, which is where all the traffic lights would turn red, all the pedestrian walk lights would turn walk in four directions and the pedestrians would rule the intersections for about 30 seconds. Baltimore had these at all the major intersections in our downtown shopping district and they called it the Barnes Dance. So Henry Barnes wrote a very funny, colorful autobiography that was published um, actually about a couple months before he died in 1968. He died of a heart attack on the job and he was the New York City Traffic Commissioner him and Robert Moses detested each other. Um, and he was sarcastic, cigar chomping, suffered fools not lightly, and wanted no one to get in his way of plowing through anything that got in the way of moving traffic. So the, the bike people that are putting all these bike lanes in, if Henry Barnes were alive today, he would be steamrolling every single bike lane back into a lane of traffic because that's what he did. But I love his quote in, in, the, in the opening pages of his autobiography, and it, it says, if I see you at the next traffic light, for both of us, I hope it's green, because while I have more than 70,000 of those red and green eyes in New York City alone, the green ones are the ones that I and millions of other drivers love the most. And I want to leave you with a scene from The Notebook. Yes, I've watched The Notebook because there's a cool signal scene that I'm going to show you.
trying to figure out what you do for fun. What do you mean? I mean, uh, I mean, all the things that you have to do, right? We've done this. <laughs> Maybe I'll watch the last change. Then we can go from green to red to yellow. You could have tried one. And the reason I wanted to show this scene is one last thing importantly that if you ever do get down to the museum to see the light, you might notice that when it changes from green to yellow to red, the yellow comes on at the same time as green and you you drive down the street, it's like, well, that's not how the traffic looks. It's like, well, actually, in 1936, most of the controllers had a green-yellow overlap that was very common well into the 1950s in some places. Baltimore City still had a few of those cycling like that well into the 1960s. So we wanted this signal to, to look and behave exactly like it did in 1936. So when Sean Breen designed the suit solid-state custom controller that's running it, which is only like the, the size of a small index card. We asked him to do the overlap green and red, and he, he did it. Um, and if, if you, it's the light's going through it right now, and then it's got a little dark out phase, because the old controllers were basically a set of cams that would knock relays on and off, and sometimes the cams would get, we call them sloppy cams, where the cams would, would need to be oiled a little bit, so there'd be this overlap uh, between the signals. So anyway, I love this scene from the notebook because it shows actually whoever made this movie had the right kind of traffic light with the right kind of sequence. And I can tell you, all of our friends, significant others, can never watch movies with us because the one thing Hollywood screws up every single time, with almost few exceptions, is the traffic signals. You have like a you have a movie set in the 1950s, and then there's this 12-inch brand new Econolite traffic on. light. I'm like, yeah. no. come on, people. <laughs> and you're always doing something shot in Canada. Yes, the Canadian, the backlit back yellow backplates. You ever see yellow backplates? It's not America, it's Canada. <laughs> Although I will say there are a few notable exceptions. Uh, I'm a big fan of the movie of Bronx Tale, which was directed by Robert De Niro. He had all the signals on that block up in the Bronx replaced with green heads, just like they did in the 1950s and 60s New York. And I thought, somebody got it right, hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just to mention that in, at least in the province of Quebec, it's all barn dance. Every time you go, it's a barn dance. That's and cool. So Japan does that too. Yeah. They still hold that right. barn dance. And I remember one day, they're very strict on the traffic because they have like stop signs, right? There was a taxi I was in, he stopped. It's the middle of the night. There's not a single car anywhere, and he's waiting for the traffic light to change. And because if he gets a ticket, he gets like a $500 fine. You know. It's wild. And by the way, I do have to. I have to thank Randy, who who made us our swag. We actually have uniforms for today. Our our three single guy shirts with actually a picture of the Hoboken Warney uh, on them. So Francis, actually, guys, come on up so you can see in the camera. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna turn you on. This is the guy that made all that. Uh, I just I just called the mayor. I bugged him until late. Diligence is a little late, I think. So yeah, you so. got you got us here, and you made Project Pony what it was. There we go. We brought this light back to life. Bob's help and ran. And we have to thank the Hoboken Historical Museum for giving it a home, for giving us a place that we can come back and see it. And now, what's really incredible is it can be used as an educational piece to tell a little story of Washington Street, of Hoboken, and 
maybe folks will learn a little bit about traffic signals too. It's actually a really fun hobby. So. You guys are amazing. Yeah. Um, um, I guess I just want to make a couple of comments. So I did the math. Frank Sinatra would have been 21 when he ran that traffic light. So it is possible. <laughs> it is possible. <laughs> the cameras didn't pick it up. No. But, uh, right. And um, I remember when you guys came and installed, and as a museum director, I did what every good museum director would do. I said, you guys got it. You guys are going to handle this. I'm out of here. I wasn't even here uh, that day, except in the oh, beginning, because right. I had purchased tickets for my, uh, for my wife, Holly, and they were scalp tickets. So they were like really expensive. And I knew when we were coordinating our dates and that, you know, your schedule is the most important because it was four of you or more. And uh, we chose October 22nd. Uh, and that just is, you know, like so Friday. It's, it's a three year it's anniversary of the anniversary. traffic light. You'll and I remember the dance. I guess it was Mayor Zimmer was uh, in her second administration. And I remember the phone calls. I forget who I, we were dealing with. I think it was this guy named Dan, who's yeah. not there anymore. And he would call and go, should I be replying back to these guys? They, they seem really serious about this topic. And, and before, before that, I don't think I'd ever thought about a traffic light I, in my life. You know, and there's a lot of ways to tell the history of a town, and why not from all the infrastructure you know, that's connected yeah. with the automobiles. And I remember thinking, should I be investing in this? And I kind of, you know, since you weren't like in the neighborhood coming by, it would be like every few months we touch base and you were pushing us. And I figured if you guys are pushing us and you're like in Maryland, the least we can do is, you know, push this forward. And then I, I never knew if it would really happen. And then when they took the traffic light down, it actually came to the garage that's part of the shipyard here because I didn't trust it down at the city garage. Right, right. So we found out which spaces aren't being used for cars. So we, you know, we got them all, we brought them all, and we were able to send some your way too, which is great. But you know, getting it was just 40%. Getting it up here installed with no one getting hurt was you know 60%. I mean, I, you know, he wants to give credit. We, we all did it as a team. You definitely you know, did. I couldn't have been up on that lift if I didn't have these guys down on the ground, right. getting this thing up and getting it strapped down tight, you know, so that we could get it up in the air. We wouldn't have the light if it wasn't for you. Right. We wouldn't be here doing this presentation, Rand and his technical skills. Right. You know, it, it's what makes the museum a community museum. Right. And I had never rented a lift before. I, you know, I'm always trying to do things on the cheap, so every construction site I'm going, yeah. can we borrow your lift for you know, six for hours? hours. Why? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So eventually bit the bullet and went to United. This truck that came to deliver this, in a sense, a little lift, because mm -hmm. it had to get through the front door, was like half a block long. It was meant for like all sorts of Big equipment. Old yeah. Exactly. And we had to, you know, getting that thing so he didn't block traffic. It was. It was pretty interesting, it but was, I'm glad we did the yeah, work. There it is. <laughs> it, was, it was a great, it was a great yeah. night. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's well, right. I think one of the scariest part was negotiating that lift through the door and making the right turn. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That thing was and just, ducking. Yeah. It was just the right size. It, 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 was, was, right it was the size. smallest one they Didn't had. Didn't come within like a, a fraction I, of an I inch of the top of the door. The door off the hinges. Yeah. So, no, it was and, all of that. And then I believe you know you were describing how we hooked it up there. There's a wood beam, which was reinforced with steel plates, yep. and then bolts had been gone Over through that, through when they rehabbed stretch, the building. Yeah. Simply took the nut off, pretty much, mm -hmm. and just slipped it on top of that. That so, was, a, by province, probably one of the best things that happened because the type of hardware they used was very similar to the type of hardware right. we were able to purchase. And, and you know, it's not stuff you come across every single day. It's not, yeah. right. you know, you, you're not going to go to Home Depot, per se. No, this was, use this this, yeah, I had actually ordered special nuts 
because I don't know, I thought we might need another one. And I remember going to McNair or you know, McMaster and ordering the huge bolts, which we, I think we used what was up there. We used, yeah, we used what was up there. And right. It worked out, and I, you couldn't have asked. It was almost like it was supposed to be that way. Right, and just think how you've used the internet to just do all the things you do, yes. to connect with each other, Absolutely. and to find these lights on yes. the Google Maps. Yes. It's a great story of, you know, using technology but respecting the old lights. Google Maps has been excellent in that, that aspect because with their their uh, their regression feature and it's the same light. You can see what might have been there before and then you see the upgrade and tell you, right. like, oh my god, it's gone. And oh, as I gone. remember, that light, this light that was rescued, was actually up on a trolley pole. It, it, it was. was yeah, it, it was yeah. definitely a line pole that supported the overhead. For the was, trolley, the electric. Yeah, I mean, they must, I don't know the year that Washington Street was converted to an electric trackless bus. I'm reasonably sure it was, a, it was a streetcar line at one point. Right. And what the cities would do is because they wanted to protect their in, in investment in the infrastructure, as they transitioned from streetcar to bus, they came up with the electric buses, which actually are zero emission. They're kind of cool. I didn't see any in any of the pictures, but right. you can see the double wires up there. Right. That was definitely and the, a line And they pole. said getting that trolley pole out, it like went down really yeah. far, cast iron yeah. encased in a concrete column. Yeah. And it's, it's they just said it, they ripped up the whole sidewalk getting it. You would look at that trolley pole. There was a couple of times in, in recent years when I visited it. You looked at that pole and you said, it has got much more time left because yeah. it was leaning right. further and further to the street. Every time you come see me, like, right. this is And now, every time I go under, like you watch the movie with the traffic light focus, whenever I drive through an intersection in an older town in a windy day, I just see this thing swagging back and forth. <laughs> I'm going, Holly, let's go, quick, quick, you know, because <laughs> it's scary when yeah. you think how heavy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, one one of the things though that the, the light did spend some time in the collection space, because I, I remember it being in our in, in you know where we keep our, our ar archives. It was on a dolly. That's right. And it That's had right. a honey. And I just remember it had a honeycomb. That's right. Oh, right. <laughs> a beehive. Yeah, beehive. Yeah. Yeah. That's yes. right. Yes. Yes. Well, you see those crazy light bulbs that yeah. were in there. We probably put it <laughs> yeah. yeah. We were afraid someone was going to steal it. I don't know. <laughs> that, well, and so we, we were too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'd be concern, checking on it. Is it still there? The big concern would have been that it could have wound up in its crack. Right, yeah. That would have been the first sure. thing that someone right. would have gone for it for, unless it was a traffic light. So if you're the traffic light <laughs> mafia, are you like a particular family, and that means there's other families out there? <laughs> <laughs> this morning. We can't talk about the traveling light mafia. <laughs> we can turn off. Okay, this one time, this one time, I'll let you ask me about my <laughs> Anyway, right, great, then. great project. It's been, uh, if I think back over things that have happened here the last 20 years, this is definitely in the top three. Well, uh, we were overjoyed to see this thing yeah. saved and hung. And, and again, I have to do a shout out. This is just a phenomenal, wonderful museum. And again, whoever's out there watching, come up and see this place. That The Washington Street exhibit is so cool. But you've um, done in the space you have. Yeah, yeah right. it really is. That is true. To make it interactive and, and, and visually interesting, it's not. And it has a traffic way. light. That's right. And, that's the and, and the Sinatra Lounge. That's you, true. You can that's listen true. to that's life and yeah. watch the lights. Yep, yep, yep. Good. Ah. Anyway, thank you. We're going to get some pizza in a few minutes, so let's hang out. Right. Thank you, everyone. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.